Welcome to the next episode in the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. This video is going to continue our discussion of Ethereum, and we're going to dive into Ethereum keys and addresses. Um, these slides are based on a Creative Commons license, and this slide deck includes content from the Mastering Ethereum GitHub site by Andreas Antonopoulos and Gavin Wood. I'd like to thank Andreas, Gavin, and the other contributors for making their content available under this license. So these slides, this video, and any other content based on these slides are covered by this Creative Commons license. Uh, just a reminder that mentions of particular blockchain projects should not be construed as an endorsement. So I'm gonna dive into cryptographic keys at an overview. I'll talk about you know, the functions of crypt crypt cryptographic uh, functions that are provided by these keys. I'll give you a brief overview of cryptography in general. Then I'll dive into public private keys. I'll talk about the elliptic curve multiplication that is used to take a private key and transform and generate the public key. Then I'll talk about the hash functions that are used to take the public key and, to, and then we hash the public key and generate an Ethereum address. So dive back into cryptography for a second. Uh, you know, Ethereum, like all cryptocurrencies, is based on cryptography, uh, which is a branch of mathematics used extensively in computer security. Uh, cryptography means secret writing in Greek. Uh, the study of cryptography encompasses more than just secret writing, though, which is which sometimes referred to as encryption. Cryptography can, for example, also be used to prove knowledge of a secret without revealing that secret. Um, sometimes that's called a zero knowledge proof. It's also uh, used when we create digital signatures. Um, you can also use cryptography to prove the authenticity of data. Uh, you know, sometimes refer to this as digital fingerprints or hashes. Uh, these types of cryptographic proofs are mathematical tools that are critical to the operation of Ethereum and other cryptographic blockchain systems. Um, and we also use these cryptographic tools in lots of different places in Ethereum applications. So uh, one little comment before we get too deep into it. Uh, we're not actually using encryption at a base level in the Ethereum. That is to say, communications between the Ethereum clients and between nodes are generally unencrypted and can be read by anyone. This is so everyone can verify the correctness of the state updates and consensus between the, uh, the blockchain nodes. In the future, advanced cryptographic tools such as zero knowledge proofs uh, will be available that allow for some encrypted calculations to be recorded in the blockchain while still enabling consensus. And in fact, I'll have a future presentation where I, where I explain what's going on in terms of bringing zero knowledge into Ethereum. So the digital keys generated in a user's wallet are completely independent of the Ethereum protocol. Uh, keys enable decentralized trust and control, ownership attestation, and our cryptographic proof security model. Keys come in pairs consisting of a private secret key and a public key. The public key is used to receive funds and the private key is used to sign the transactions to spend the funds. So let's dive into some of these uh, cryptographic building blocks before we go any further with our discussion of keys. So originally when people were uh, using cryptography, they wanted to send messages, they wanted to keep the messages secret. And so they were focused on encryption. The original approach to encryption was referred to as symmetric encryption. The idea was that if Alice wanted to tell Bob a secret, Alice and Bob would have this shared secret key, uh, and then they would send messages using the shared secret key. Alice would encrypt the message. She'd send it to Bob. Bob would decrypt the message using his copy of the shared secret key, and then he could read the message. So for example, if Alice wanted to send a message to Bob saying, hey, I love Ethereum, she would encrypt that message using a shared secret key that only Bob has a copy of. Um, then she produced a ciphertext, which is, you know, the encrypted version of I love Ethereum. Bob would receive that ciphertext. He would decrypt it using his copy of the shared secret key. He'd read that Alice loves Ethereum and he'd understand what the message is. Now, there's a problem with this approach. The first problem with the approach is that Alice and Bob would have to have a shared secret key. Uh, you know, if a hacker got a copy of the shared secret key, then the hacker could read all the messages. So somehow Bob has to get a copy of the shared secret key from Alice so that he can read the messages. Um, 
without having any the hacker get a, get a copy of the message. So that's a problem. There are some other problems with symmetric encryption, but that's the main one, is how do you securely deliver that secret key to Bob? So symmetric encryption has this problem that both parties rely on a shared secret key. In general, symmetric encryption, everything about the cryptographic algorithm is known by the public, except for what the shared secret key is that only the parties should know. Um, and there are some ways to increase randomness because uh, you want to make it as ran uh, appear as random as possible to make it hard for the hacker to break it. Now, you should not create your own symmetric encryption algorithm. Instead, use a standard. Uh, and in fact, AES is the advanced encryption standard, and, it, um, and it's a highly recognized uh, encryption uh, standard. Uh, and there are some other standards, cryptographic libraries. So use a standard. Don't create your own encryption approach. All right. Well, there was this problem of how does Alice and Bob both get a copy of the shared secret key without the hacker also getting a copy? Well, in the 1970s, people started, you know, came up with a solution to how to deal with this problem. And the, and the solution they came up with of distributing the key is referred to as asymmetric encryption. In this idea, uh, the idea is that Bob has a two part key. He has a secret key, which only he knows, and he's got a public key that he can let the entire world know about. Um, and you can think of this almost as like, let's suppose that I have an email address that you can send me email at, and I'll let the whole world know what my email address is. But I don't let anyone know what the password is because I'm going to use my password to read my messages. Um, and so that's the same type of idea with this public key and secret key is Bob has his secret password that he uses to read his messages and he's got his public key he tells the world about where he's saying, hey, send me a message at this address. All right. So how does Alice send a message securely so that no one else can read it with this asymmetric encryption approach? So Alice has a copy of Bob's public key because everybody in the world has it. Uh, or everyone who cares about it has it. So she has her message, I love Ethereum, and she encrypts that message using Bob's public key. And this creates a ciphertext. And the only person who can read this message that's been encrypted by Bob's public key is someone who has a copy of Bob's secret key. Um, and then when you use Bob's secret key to decrypt it, uh, you see the message, I love Ethereum. The way the reason this works is there's a mathematical relationship between the public key and the secret key so that anything that's encrypted by the public key can only be read by someone who has the secret key. Um, and so this is referred to as asymmetric encryption. Uh, this in our, it's sometimes referred to as public key cryptography. This was invented in the 1970s. Uh, mathemat mathematical formulas like prime number exponents and elliptic curve multiplication um, and those sorts of uh, algorithms are used in this sort of public key cryptography. And one of the features of these types of formulas is they're easy to calculate in one direction and extremely difficult to calculate in the opposite direction. And so based on these functions, cryptography enables the creation of these digital secrets that were encrypted and also that we're going to talk about unforgeable digital signatures. And so we use a public key cryptography to create key pairs that control access to cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, and we're going to use a particular algorithm referred to as elliptic curves, and we'll use that to generate a public key from a private key. Um, but it, it doesn't work in reverse. So if you know the public key, you can't figure out the private key. Um, the evolution of public key, private key over the last 40, 50 years. Uh, this was originally developed actually by British intelligence in the late 60s, but they kept it a secret and didn't tell anybody about it. Uh, the first public uh, announcement of public key, private key was by Diffie Hellman in 76 and RSA in 77. Elliptic curve cryptography was identified in 1985. Um, now, none of the early technologies are resistant to quantum computing, and quantum computing is advancing rather quickly. Uh, but um, there is work by the standard bodies on developing quantum resistant key pairs. Uh, elliptic curve cryptography entered wide usage in 2005, primarily because it was faster and more efficient than Diffie-Hellman and RSA. 
And of course, um, since elliptic curve algorithms entered usage in 2005, um, Bitcoin was developed in 2008 and 2000, and Ethereum was developed, you know, five years later. So that's why Ethereum and Bitcoin both rely on ECC. Uh, so let's take a look at this digital signatures that I mentioned that also relies on public key cryptography. So the basic idea behind digital signatures is not that we want to keep something secret, but we want to attest that I am the one who signed this message. You know, it's almost like signing the check. I sign the check, I put my signature on it, and then the bank is going to authorize the payment of funds. Similarly, if I want to pay someone in Ethereum or if I ETH, or if I want to pay them in Bitcoin, BTC, um, I use my digital signature to sign over my funds to them. So the way it works is, let's say in this case, Alice wants to send some ETH to Bob. So her message is, hey, have some ETH. Um, She's going to sign it using her private key. Then she sends this signed message over to Bob, and Bob can use Alice's public key to verify that, yes, this message came from Alice. So again, just like with Bob, she keeps her private key a secret that only she knows, and everybody knows the public key. Now, if the hacker did get a copy of Alice's private key, then he could spend her ETH. So it's really important that you keep your private keys private and secure. And we're going to talk about that in more detail when we do our lecture on wallets and how, to, how wallets work to keep private keys secret. So the basic idea behind digital signatures, again, is they leverage public key encryption. Alice publishes her, her public key. Anyone can send an encrypted message to Alice using her public key. And only Alice can decrypt messages with her secret key. So that's when you're using public key, private key for encryption. When you want to use it for digital signatures, Alice publishes her public key for verifying the signatures. And anyone can check a message was signed by Alice. And only Alice can send signed messages using the secret key. Um, let's talk about hashes. Because we're going to talk about hashes and how use them when Bitcoin is generating addresses. Hashes take any size string as an input. Um, it could be up to terabytes in size, and they have a fixed size output. So, example, 256 bits per SHA-256. Hashes are collision-free. That is, it's difficult to find X and Y such that X is not equal to Y, and the hash of X is equal to the hash of Y. And given the hash of X, it's hard to find X. You know, it's, it's one way function, basically. Um, it's easy to take X and get hash of X. It's hard to take hash of X and figure out, hey, the original value was X. Um, and if we know hash of X equals hash Y, then it's safe to assume that X and Y are identical. Uh, and so where are hashes used? Very often they're used in message digests or recognizing files. Uh, so you store that hash of a file, and then you can recompute the hash of the file, compare the computed hash to the stored hash. Two hashes are equal, the file has not been modified. Two hashes don't match, you know the file has been modified. And it's very efficient to store hashes because they tend to be tiny compared to the file size. So we use hashes a lot in blockchains because we're publishing this information across all the different nodes in the blockchain and literally thousands of nodes. So we want to keep the amount of information stored in the blockchain small. So we publish the hashes and keep you know large amounts of data off chain. So let's dive into more specifically how Ethereum is handling accounts. So Ethereum has two different types of accounts, externally owned accounts or EOAs, and it's got contracts or smart contracts. Ownerships of Ether by these externally owned accounts through is established through digital private keys, you know, because the externally owned accounts are users, people uh, with wallets. Uh, whereas the contracts are actually on chain. Um, and so we're using these digital private keys I just talked about and Ethereum addresses and digital signatures to control uh, Ether uh, it, uh, through the externally owned accounts. And so the private keys are at the heart of all the user interaction with Ethereum. Uh, in fact, account addresses are derived directly from private keys. A private key uniquely determines a single Ethereum address, also known as account. Private keys aren't directly used in the Ethereum system in any way. Uh, the private keys are never transmitted or stored on, on Ethereum. 
in the blockchain. That is to say that private keys should remain private. They should never appear in messages past the network, nor should they be stored on chain. Only account addresses and digital signatures are ever transmitted and stored on the Ethereum system. For more information, you know, on how to keep private keys safe and secure, we'll talk about it in our chapter in our lecture on wallets. So access and control of funds is achieved with digital signatures which you know, are created using the private keys I just showed you. Ethereum transactions require a valid digital signature uh, to be included in the blockchain. Anyone with a copy of the private key would have control of the corresponding account and any Ether that account holds. Assuming a user keeps their private key safe, uh, the digital signature in Ethereum transactions prove the true owner of the funds because they prove ownership of the private key. Uh, the digital signatures and Ethereum transactions uh, are really important for that reason. So in public key cryptography based systems, uh, keys come in pairs consistent of private secret key and the public key. Um, and generally it's considered a key pair, but really in uh, for the purposes of Ethereum, the public key is computed from the private key. So you compute the pri create the private key first, and then you compute the, pri the private key. And so as I mentioned earlier, you can think of it like a password and an email address, or you can think about a bank account number and a PIN number. Um, it's the password or the PIN that provides control over the account. And it's the other, the account number or the email address that identifies it to others. As I mentioned, uh, the private keys should be kept securely. Um, and usually, in fact, uh, the private keys are never seen by the users. It's hidden away in your Ethereum wallet uh, in a special file and managed by Ethereum wallet software. In the uh, payment portion of Ethereum transaction, the intended recipient is represented by an Ethereum address, which is used in the same way as the beneficiary account details of a bank transfer. Um, an Ethereum address for an end use, end, uh, externally owned account is generated from the public key portion of the key pair. However, not all Ethereum addresses represent public key, private key pairs. They can also represent smart contracts, which we'll see in the smart contracts lecture. And the smart contracts themselves don't have private keys. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about cryptography. Um, the basic idea between these public key and pri private keys is that, uh, and many of these other cryptography functions that we're going to be talking about, is that they're one-way uh, functions. That is, it's easy to calculate it one direction, but hard to calculate the inverse. So for example, let's think about prime factors. Suppose you wanted to multiply 4,003 times 2,003. Uh, these are 4,003 and 2,003 are two prime numbers. Uh, you multiply them together, you get 8 million and something, 8 million, 18,009. But let's suppose I just gave you that number, 8 million, 18,009. I ask you to tell me uh, what are the two prime factors that when you multiply them together, you get this number. It would take you a while to figure that out. Um, and so that's the basic idea. You could rapidly multiply, do the, 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 the multiplication uh, and give me an answer to that multiplication within 30 seconds or faster, uh, but it would take you a long time to give me the two prime numbers that result in 8,018,009. Um, so we use the same sort of approach in computing the public key, private key relationship. Um, it's an algorithm similar to this, but it's based on elliptic curve arithmetic uh, using uh, multiplication uh, where the multiplication of the module of the prime is relatively straightforward, but the division is extremely difficult. So for Ethereum transactions, the details of a transaction are used as a message. And the mathematics of elliptic curve cryptography provides a way for the message to be combined with the private key to create a digital signature that can only be produced using the private key. 
When a transaction is sent to the Ethereum network, it'll be sent off a digital signature created with the private key corresponding to the Ethereum address. And so anyone can use elliptic curve mathematics to verify a transaction. Uh, verification doesn't require a private key and it remains a secret. So a private key is simply a number picked at random. Ownership and control of the private key is uh, the root of user control over all funds associated with the corresponding Ethereum address, as well as access to con smart contracts that authorize that address. The private key is used to create the digital signatures required to spend Ether by proving ownership of the funds using a transaction. The private key must remain secret at all times because revealing it to third parties is equivalent to giving them control over the Ether and the contracts secured by that private key. The private key must also be backed up and protected from accidental loss. You know, if the if the private key is lost, then you then the funds that are secured by it are lost by two. So you can think of the Ethereum private key as just really a number. You know, one way to pick your private keys randomly would be to use a coin, pencil, and paper, toss a coin 256 times, and you'd have your binary digits, uh, you know, zero or one, depending on whether you roll tails or heads, uh, for a random private key that you could use in an Ethereum wallet. Uh, the public key and the address can then be generated from the private key. Um, Ethereum software, uh, you know, is essentially just, uh, you know, an Ethereum key is really just pick a number between one and two to 56. The exact method you use to pick that number doesn't matter as long as it's not predictable or deterministic. Ethereum software uses the underlying Operating systems random number generator produce 256 random bits of entropy or randomness. Usually the operating system random number generator is initialized by a human source of randomness. Uh, so essentially though, a private key is, is a massively large number. You know, you know, it could be up to two to 256, you know, a 78 digit number. Um, Here's an example of a randomly generated private key shown here. An Ethereum public key is essentially a point on an elliptic curve, meaning it's a set of X and Y coordinates to satisfy the elliptic curve equation. Uh, it's essentially, you know, two numbers joined together, those X and Y coordinates. And those numbers can be produced from the private key by this one way calculation. So it's easy to take your private key and compute the public key, but it's going to be very difficult to figure out what the private key is, even though you know what the public key is. So here is our formula for doing elliptic curve multiplication. Um, small k is your private key. Cap Big K is your public key, and G is a constant point referred to as a generator point. Um, and then the asterisk here is a special elliptic curve multiplication operator. So that's not normal multiplication. But basically, it's private key times this generator point results in public key. Um, and it's relatively efficient to do this, but figuring, even though you know what the generator point is, doing the division and figuring out what the small k is, is, is essentially impossible. Because again, this isn't normal multiplication. This is a special multiplication where it's very difficult to do division. And in fact, there's no practical thing as the division. Um, and so here's, by the way, is a look at what elliptic curve looks like. It's basically a curve you know, flipped on its side and it's a cubed curve, which is why we have this sort of indention thing going on. And the actual algorithm is y squared equals x cubed plus seven. Um, and this is often done in modular terms. So it's y squared mod p equals x cubed plus seven mod p. Uh, and mod p is a modulo prime number p, which indicates that this curse is, curve is over a finite field of prime order p. Uh, also known as, you know, prime order P. 
uh, finite field of prime order p. And where p equals 2 to the 256, which is an extremely large number, minus 2 to the 32, minus 2 to the 9, minus 2 to the 8, minus 2 to 7, minus 2 to 6, minus 2 to 4, minus 1, which is a very large prime number for p. Uh, which means that your actual curve here is getting, you know, going to be pretty interesting. Um, you can also visualize the elliptic curve over certain values, uh, you know, the various points, uh, and you can check the points exist on the curve. Um, the Ethereum actually uses a specific um, elliptic curve, which is referred to as the SecP. 256 k1 curve um and here's you know some of the coordinates on that curve uh, showing you the prime numbers i'm not going to go into all this math there are a lot of videos and other materials you can find on the internet that goes through it uh, but the basic idea is that um you know you can draw lines on this curve and that's what's being used to generate the public key from the private key You can also do multiplication and addition. I'm not going to go through all of this in elliptic curve. Uh, but basically, getting back to how we generate the key, uh, we start off with our private key. We do the special multiplication with this generator point G. And the generator point G is a standard point that stays the same. So the only thing, and then it computes the public key. Uh, so your private key will vary uh, with whatever you created for your private key. And then this is used to create the K. Um, and so although G is a standard, uh, since uh, this multiplication is so complicated, uh, it's simply not possible to go from big K to figure out what small K is. Now, public, there's a number of different uh, standards for how keys can be stored in wallets. And one of those standards deals with compressed or uncompressed keys. Um, And because key size can be important uh, with regards to public keys, with regards to transactions, one approach to dealing with it is referred to as a compressed public key standard to keep the size of public keys smaller. Uh, but that does make some for some differences in how you store your public keys. Uh, so here's just a look at a couple different approaches. Uh, it's not really tremendously important for our purposes. Uh, as to whether you have an uncompressed or compressed uh, uh, public key. But if you're doing something that handles a lot of public keys, then going compressed is going to be more efficient. Um, so here's an example of a calculation of taking a private key and then calculating a public key. So here we've got a private key. Let's, uh, this is shown in hexadecimal format. So we've got K equals F8, F8, A2, whatever. Again, this number here is got to be a random number. And you never want to let anyone see it. You want to keep it hidden away in your wallet, which we'll talk about more about uh, in the next lecture. Um, then we take this number. We, we use our special ECC math multiplication times the generator point, And that gives us our big K. Now, again, we're getting a, a point on a curve. So it's actually going to be an x, y coordinate on the curve. So in this particular case, we take this number, we multiply it times g, we get an x value of, again, in hexadecimal format, 0 to 9, a through f. We get 6e, 14, whatever, and we get 83b, whatever, for our y format. And so what you do is you take uh, what uh, Ethereum does is it'll take that x coordinate followed by the Y coordinate. And I'll put in a couple of uh, formatting things and that becomes your public key. So if we look down here at this public key, uh, we'll have 04 to begin with. Then it'll be the 6E145, uh, this whole long string. Um, then we will go and we'll start with our Y string. You know, you can see here we go 07B, which ends up right there. And then we immediately go to the Y value, 83B, and then that goes ahead and ends in D0. So the only format we put in here was this 04 at the beginning. And then it's just straight X format plus Y format. And that's your public key. 
Um, there are a number of different implementations of this elliptic curve that Ethereum relies on. There's OpenSSL. Um, there's the LiveSec uh, implementation that Bitcoin Core relies on. Um, cryptographic hash functions, which I mentioned earlier, are used throughout Ethereum. You know, a hash function is really just a one-way fact function to map data of any size into data of a fixed size. Um, there are a lot of properties of cryptographic fu hash functions that make them ideal for Ethereum and other cryptocurrencies. Uh, they're deterministic. A given input message will produce the same output. It's easy to verify. Uh, a small change to the message will change the hash output. Um, and again, similar to elliptic curve cryptography, it's one way, very difficult to go in the reverse. Um, and it should be very difficult to calculate two different inputs that will produce the same output. Now, it's not impossible to do that, but extremely difficult to the point where it's not practical. So hashes are used all the time for a wide range of security applications, including data fingerprinting, message integrity, proof of work, authentication, password hashing, pseudo random number generators, unique identifiers, and so on. So Ethereum uses a different algorithm than Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin uses SHA-256 and RIPE-MD. Um, Ethereum uses Kesek-256. Uh, Kesek-256 was designed as a candidate for the SHA-3 uh, cryptographic hash function. Um, it is not, in fact, in fact, the SHA-3 standard, but it was designed for it. Um, the implementation differences between SHA-3 and Kesek-256 are slight, uh, but they are significant in their different outputs. So an Ethereum address is a unique identifier that's derived from the public keys or a contract using, the, the, using our Kesek-256 one-way hash function. So looking at our previous example, we had small k, our private key, which is our random number that we came up with, however we came up with it. Then we used our elliptic curve cryptography to generate capital K. Now we're going to use capital K with Kesek-256 to calculate the hash of that public key. So we pass in K, big K, into Kesek-256, and we get this hash output. 2A, 5BC, et cetera. Now we're gonna, now this is uh, 256 bits or 32 bytes. We're gonna drop the first 12 bytes. So we're only gonna keep the last 20 bytes of this and that's gonna be our Ethereum address. So if you're looking at this right here, we're gonna start, we're gonna drop everything from this nine over and we'll start with 001D3. And so that becomes our Ethereum address, 001D3. And we'll put a 0x prefix in front of it to indicate it's a hexadecimal number. So it'll be 0x, 001, et cetera. So that's an Ethereum address. Now this is actually a much easier way to compute an address than the approach that Bitcoin follows. Bitcoin actually follows a more complicated approach to generate an address. Um, now, Bitcoin addresses actually have a built-in checksum to protect against mistyped addresses. Ethereum addresses, however, do not have a built-in checksum. And the reason why they don't have a checksum built in uh, was that originally the idea was that Ethereum would have higher level services that would hire the, hide the address. Just as the address hides the public coin, um, I'm sorry, the address hides the uh, public key, the idea was there'd be something else hiding the address, uh, like a name service. Um, and that it would be the name service that would have a checksum, but that the address wouldn't need it. However, uh, those name services came along uh, slower than was expected and addresses were used heavily. And now because they're being used heavily, there's resistance to change. And so we don't have checksums in the addresses at this time. The uh, inner exchange client address protocol 
is an Ethereum address encoding that is partly compatible with the international bank account number or IBAN encoding, offering a versatile checksum than interoperable encoding for Ethereum addresses. ICAP addresses can encode Ethereum addresses or common names registered with an Ethereum name registry. Uh, IBAN is an international standard that uh, for identifying bank account numbers, it's mostly used for wire transfers. It's broadly used in the euro, single euro payments area. It's centralized and heavily regulated service. ICAP is decentralized compatible implementation for Ethereum. An IBAN consists of up to 34 alphanumeric characters comprising a country code, a checksum, and a bank account identifier. ICAP uses the same structure by introducing a non-standard country code that stands for Ethereum, followed by a checksum and an account identifier. Um, and here are your options for your, you know, direct is a big Endian base 36 integer. Basic is 31 characters and indirect is an identifier that resides to an ETH address through a, a name provider. Um, we can also do hex encoding with checksum and capitalization, which was part of the Ethereum improvement proposal 55. Um, EIP 55 offers a backward compatible checksum for Ethereum addresses by modifying the capitalization of the hexadecimal address. The idea is that Ethereum addresses are case insensitive and all wallets are supposed to accept Ethereum addresses expressed in capital or lowercase characters without any difference in interpretation. By modifying the capitalization of the alphabetic characters in the address, we can convey a checksum that can be used to protect the integrity of the address against typing or uh, reading mistakes. Wallets that don't support EIP-55 checksums will simply ignore the fact that the address contains capitals. But those that do support it can validate it and contact theirs with a extremely high accuracy. The mixed capitals encoding is subtle and you may miss it at first. So for example, uh, our example address is the 001D3, F1E, whatever. With an EIP-55 mixed capitalization checksum, you'll notice immediately that um, some of your letters are now capitalized. So this lowercase f becomes a capital F. Lowercase a e now has a capital A and a lowercase e. Lowercase b d e c f is now capital B D E C F. Lowercase f is still lowercase f. Uh, lowercase b is still b, but a became capitalized and f became capitalized. Um, and so the combination of what they're choosing to capitalize versus lowercase is now going to be essentially a checksum to allow you to verify that none of that data has been modified. So the way it works is we're taking a CASIC 256 hash of the lowercase address that hash acts, as a, acts as a digital fingerprint of the address, giving us our checksum, and that's then encoded in the selection of the capitals in the address. So in summary, cryptography is a methodology for hiding information in uh, using public keys and private keys. These keys serve as a secure mechanism to control ownership of blockchain funds, addresses, and digital signatures. Uh, crypto cryptographic functions are mathematically proven one-way functions. We're finding the value of Y from X is easy, but finding the value of X from Y is extremely difficult. Uh, private keys are randomly generated large numbers that one can use to securely perform transactions. Uh, you know, and you need to keep your private keys uh, secret at all times. And your public key is a cryptographic key generated from the private key by using a one-way function like the elliptic curve cryptography. Um, Ethereum uses a particular elliptic curve multiplication of cryptography. You know, a hash function takes an input and returns a hash with a fixed number of characters. And cryptographic hash functions are irreversible. Hash functions that are suitable for cryptography for many reasons. Um, and Ethereum is using the Kesek 256 algorithm for hashing. Kesek 256 is a specialized SHA-3 type hashing algorithm. Um, and these Ethereum addresses are calculated from the public keys. And then they're serialized as hexadecimal hashes. 
And there are various standards such as high caps that can allow you to have a human readable Ethereum address format. All right, um, I wanna thank everyone for watching this uh, brief little lecture on Ethereum keys and addresses, part of the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. Tune in next time when I'm going to dive deeper into Ethereum wallets and how the Ethereum wallets manage your keys and addresses.